Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Marty Grubbs is the pastor at Crossings Community Church. Marty, if you would come up. Uh, you know, um, about 20 years ago, I was in television news business, but was thinking about um, having a second career in politics. And Marty recalls that, you know, when you're about to make a significant life change, one of the things you do is you go to your church pastor and talk to him about it. And I, Marty and I had lunch and I told him what I was thinking. And I don't know what he was really thinking, but he was very supportive uh, <laughs> out, outwardly. And he has been here um, when I was sworn into city council and then sworn into mayor. And I asked him if he wouldn't come back today, uh, some many years later, and, and be a part of, of today's and what is my last city council meeting. So, Marty, thanks very much. Uh, when you're done, I'll ask Councilman Stone Cipher to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everyone please stand? Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving Father, we're so thankful for the privilege and the freedom we have to be in this place. We thank you for the leadership of this council. We thank you, Father, for our city and the way you have continued to bring us good things. Father, thank you for Mick Cornett. Thank you for his willingness to put himself out there many years ago and choose to serve. And thank you, Father, for how he has served us so well. Thank you for the good that has come to our city because of his leadership. So, Father, we pray you will bless him in all that is yet to come, and we thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Place the flag. And allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have some uh, people here today representing Tree City USA and Oklahoma City's contingent. Could you all come forward? We have a lot of streaks going, but we have been a part of a very distinct group of American cities that have been honored by Tree City USA for 13 years in a row. How about a round of applause for that? Um, We have a citation. I'll ask the clerk to read it, and then we'll get settled up here. <laughs> we'll just make one up. <laughs> whereas, whereas the city of Oklahoma City has attained the status of Tree City USA for 2018, and whereas the citizens of the city of Oklahoma City are to be commended for taking pride in their community through beautification which has led to this outstanding recognition, and whereas, in as much as it is fitting and proper, the legislature of the great state of Oklahoma hereby lauds and commends the city of Oklahoma City upon its designation as a Tree City USA for 2018. Thank you all very much. And uh, Mark, you want to give us a little bit of background on Tree City USA? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Mark Bays. I'm with Oklahoma Forestry Services, and we are the partners with the National Arbor Day Foundation. And the National Arbor Day Foundation got started way back in 1872 up in Nebraska, out on the prairie, just like we are here in Oklahoma. And they saw that there was a real need to plant trees on the prairie. And so they designated this whole program during that time to plant trees, and that's when Arbor Day first started. 1976, they said, well, let's just recognize these cities that are doing all these great things across the country. And that's when the Tree City USA program actually started. So Oklahoma City has been at it for quite some time, because if you look at some of those early pictures of Oklahoma City, there's not a lot of trees. There's, there's, and we are on the prairie. And we've done so much work. And, and a lot of that work has happened early, and especially under your reign as the mayor. Uh, the Park Department has done just some tremendous things in the last several years under Doug Cupper's leadership and, and the forestry crew's leadership. We now have an inventory for all the trees on the city parks, a 100% inventory of all the trees in the developed areas, over 19,000 trees. They know the species, they know the size, they know the, 
you know, their condition. And so they're better able now to manage and care for that resource. And so that's one of the things under your leadership uh, that Oklahoma City continues to grow. And this is its 13th year in a row being recognized by the Arbor Day Foundation as a Tree City USA. And it's certainly an honor to be there on their behalf presenting this flag to you. So if I can unfold the flag and show everybody. <laughs> When you're doing live television, they, they teach you to never give up the microphone. <laughs> All right. Like Mark said, if you look at those early day photos right after the land run, I think there are two trees in Oklahoma City. They were cottonwoods, and historians now kind of, all the landmarks, when they look at those pictures, they look to where the cottonwood trees, and so then they can figure out where the rest of the city was there. And so, yeah, those two cottonwoods are long gone, but we've, we've, uh, we've created an, an incredible canopy for Oklahoma City. Um, next up, April is litter blitz so let's bring up our representatives from oklahoma city beautiful how about a round of applause for oklahoma city beautiful. Thank you. and uh, i won't be so presumptuous as to assume you have the proclamation i do your okay. honor great if you would read the proclamation then whereas litter is a critical factor in our city's economic health and a clean city reduces taxpayers cost to remove the litter and attract new businesses. Whereas Oklahoma City Beautiful and the City of Oklahoma City are teaming up for Litter Blitz 2018. Whereas Litter Blitz 2018 is an effort to clean up area, neighborhoods, parks, streets, and businesses to help beautify Oklahoma City. Whereas neighborhoods, civic, church, and business groups can register their team to pick up litter on a date they choose. Each team will receive a packet with free trash bags, gloves, and tips for a safe and successful cleanup. Whereas last year, over 10,000 volunteers participated in the community cleanup, and over 171,000 pounds of trash was collected from our public spaces. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of April as Litter Blitz 2018, in Oklahoma City, and he encourages all citizens to help combat litter in their parks, schools, neighborhoods, and other locations throughout the community. Let's show our appreciation for Oklahoma City Beautiful. I'll, uh, and uh, it, is, it is well known, but a message that's not a completely penetrated every neighborhood, that Oklahoma City Beautiful will help you clean up your neighborhood. If you have a, a Cub Scout troop or a neighborhood association, and you'd like a little bit of help in organizing a cleanup effort, all you have to do is give them a call. They have all the tools, the gloves, the bags. They, they make it safe and easy and guide you through the whole process. And collectively, it makes a big difference. Um, I can't tell you uh, how many comments I get from visitors who talk about what a clean city Oklahoma City is. And a lot of that attention comes from Oklahoma City Beautiful and all the coordination they do with all the neighborhoods across the city. So, Lisa, thank you. And I'm going to give you the microphone and let you kind of remind people how they can engage your office. Well, just give us a call or go to our website, okcbeautiful.com, and you can fill out a form and we will get you fixed up with all the supplies. Uh, last Saturday night, Oklahoma City celebrated our, kicked off our 50th anniversary celebration and we're, we've been picking up trash for 50 years and we're going to do it for at least another 50 so come help us we appreciate it thank you let's round of applause thank you very much thank you mother earth thank you all right and today we are going to uh, publicly thank um, uh, a group of citizens who have gone above and beyond uh, the volunteer uh, volunteerism and that is participate on the maps for kids trust uh, many of them uh, for up to 17 years while we finish the projects of building new schools uh, in the oklahoma city public school system and suburban districts so i'm going to ask all the trust trustees that have come in today to come forward mayor humphreys who helped 
put these people on the docket way back in uh, 2001 when we were passing the Maps for Kids sales tax and putting the bond issue before the voters. Um, this group has overseen the construction of about 75 school buildings. Uh, some of these buildings were built anew. Uh, all the other schools were refurbished. An additional $150 million was distributed to the 23 suburban districts that serve children who have kids going um, in, in Oklahoma City. And those projects have, for the most part, been completed. We dissolved the trust just a couple of weeks ago, and this is a chance for the, for the public to officially thank these trustees who might have gotten on as far back as 2001, not necessarily knowing what they were volunteering for uh, or showing their willingness to serve. But we do have a, a, a resolution today. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas on August 14, 2001, the City Council of Oklahoma City approved a resolution establishing the Oklahoma City Metropolitan Area Public Schools Trust and adopted the trust indenture setting out its duties, membership, and terms. Whereas on November 13, 2001, city voters approved ordinance number 21805, which provided for a limited term sales tax from January 2002 through December 2008 to fund the mission of the OC Maps Trust to administer these tax revenues for the funding and management of construction and renovation of public school facilities, playgrounds, furnishings, fixtures, and equipment. Whereas the total collected revenues were over $566 million. Whereas the OC Maps Trust managed improvements to District I-89 public schools and funded improvements in the 23 suburban school districts that were at least partially located within the, in the city and attended by city resident students. Whereas the program, commonly known as Maps for Kids, was one of the most ambitious funding mechanisms for capital improvements to public schools undertaken by any city in America. It provided over $411 million for District I-89 and over $155 million for the 23 suburban school districts. The construction of three new high schools and three new elementary schools, the renovation of more than 65 schools, much needed technology upgrades, including more than 10,000 new computers, 1,100 presentation stations, nearly 4,000 laptops and wireless systems, and 160 new school buses. Whereas recommendations and prudent management of the Maps for Kids program by the OC Maps Trust resulted in substantial enhancements to the program, including 45 early start roofing and fire alarm projects and the management of the District I-89 2007 bond program. Whereas the OC Maps Trust met regularly for over 16 years to complete its mission. Whereas trustees Carl Edwards, J.W. Mashburn, Valerie Thompson, Patrick Rooney, Carrie Decker, Anthony Francisco, and Reuben Aragon, along with former trustees Linda Lambert, Stanley Huffill, Rudy Alvarado, Dave Lopez, Claudia San Pedro, and Carl Springer, performed their duties with excellence and always with the best interests of Oklahoma City school children and the trust in mind. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend the trustees of the Oklahoma City Metropolitan Area Public Schools Trust for their dedicated public service. have the opportunity frequently to travel and talk about Oklahoma City's success story. And one of the elements that people sometimes want to hear about is maps for kids, because almost every big city out there has some sort of deferred maintenance built into their inner city school system, and, and we addressed it. And when I describe what we did, I can see on their faces, they're not saying we should do that. What they're thinking to themselves is we could never do that. <laughs> And, um, and, and part of the, the, the genius of this, I, I think, in the consensus building aspect was by former Mayor Humphreys um, working with uh, Cliff Hudson and other business leaders back in 2000, 
2000 and 2001 and ultimately taking it to the city council and calling for an election. The consensus building that went on in that process is extraordinary. Uh, getting 24 school districts to agree to one funding program. Uh, I also want to point out the great work of the city staff uh, in Maps for Kids, and uh, including our finance department. When Maps for Kids was called, there was an expectation by our staff that the sales tax would bring in $512 million. Seven years later, they counted it up and it came in at 514. That's, that's some pretty good prognostication. And when you're building big problems and big projects in schools, you need a good number. And our city staff really came through uh, with providing a good number that we could use to estimate the cost of the projects to make sure that every neighborhood got what it needed. Uh, you've shown a very generous applause to these people, and I can tell you every bit of it is deserved. Uh, the Oklahoma City Public School System is in a much better position uh, today than they were when, when this took it on. And uh, whenever I'm out in the, in the uh, uh, suburban districts, it's not, it's, it's not uncommon to get a thank you from them as well. They realize that how they've all um, received a benefit, a new school, a new playground, kind of depends on the size of their district, but they've all benefited from the generosity of Oklahoma City voters and uh, this trust who has overseen the project. So one more round of applause as I pass these out. Thank you. You are dismissed <laughs> after 17 years. Thank you for your service. Thanks, JW. Thanks, JW. If you're around City Hall very long, you learn quickly that our number one priority is public safety. And typically when we're talking about public safety, we're talking about police officers and firefighters or the equipment and the training that they need. But there's one very important element to all of that that we're gonna draw attention to this morning. And that is the 911 operators who have to dispatch the first responders to get to the scene entire. So come on up, we have, um, Let's see, it's, it's Public Safety Telecommunicator Appreciation Week, and we have um, with us several members of our public safety communication staff. So Jamie O'Leary is here, and uh, let's see, uh, Florencio Chavez is not here. Oh, it's here, did I mispronounce it? A substitution, okay. <laughs> well, she's probably taking 911 calls. Uh, Keisha McGarry, uh, Robert Carter, Kristen Osentowski, thank you all very much for your service. You know, you can, you can have all the first responders you want, but if, if there's a communication breakdown when that phone call is made and the person that's answering it doesn't know what to do or doesn't handle it correctly, uh, all the other preparation doesn't work. And so I really think it's appropriate that we thank these workers and also the ones that are currently back at, at the 911 center taking those calls. This is a tough job, and uh, they deserve the appreciation you're about to give them. Please show your and, uh, We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, and whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who call the Oklahoma City Emergency Communications Center. Public safety dispatchers and call takers are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services. Whereas by monitoring police by radio, public safety dispatchers are the single vital link for the officers, providing critical information to the officers in the field helps to ensure their safety. Public safety dispatchers and call takers of the Oklahoma City Police Department have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. 
Whereas each public safety dispatcher and call taker has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their jobs in the last year. Public safety dispatchers and call takers are at their best helping others through the worst situations imaginable. Whereas public safety dispatchers and call takers save lives and change lives one call at a time. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim April 8th through 14th as Public Safety Telecommunication Appreciation Week in Oklahoma City. So our appreciation. Mayor, of, of all the people to come down and speak, unfortunately you are stuck with me this morning. Uh, and at this time I'd like to invite your family to join us. And while they're coming up, I'd like to again recognize former Mayor uh, Kirk Humphreys, uh, former council people Sam Bowman and Simac, and my mentor Jerry Foshi. In fact, we had two of the most recognized citizens of Ward 5 this morning, J.W. Mashburn and former Councilman Jerry Foshi with us this morning. And uh, we have a resolution for you, but before we do, uh, I'd like to just mention, you know, the term leadership is often used and it's, it's unfortunate because the more it's used, uh, the less impressive it becomes. But Mayor, you certainly uh, qualify for the use of strong leadership. The city of Oklahoma City could not have accomplished all the many things that it has during these 14 years without your leadership, and it's, it's greatly appreciated, not just by the members of the council, but all citizens of Oklahoma City and the entire state, so we thank you very much. Uh, for example, like uh, in athletics and in business, you know, people have a successful year or two, and they say, oh, it's attributable to great leadership. But when you look at the truly great leaders, like uh, Coach John Wooden at UCLA winning 10 uh, national championships in his last year, uh, that's true leadership, and that's quality leadership, and that's what we've had uh, with you as our mayor, and so uh, we thank you again very much. And we have a resolution uh, we'd like for Francis to read. Whereas Mayor Mick Cornett is the first four-term mayor in Oklahoma City history, having served in that position from 2004 to 2018. Whereas in 2001, he challenged a two-term incumbent on the city council and won the council seat by the largest margin over a sitting incumbent in city history. Whereas Mayor Cornette has received many honors during his tenure as mayor, including being selected as the best mayor in the state and nation and runner-up to the top mayor in the world, according to an international panel. Newsweek magazine selected him as one of the five most innovative mayors in the United States. Governing magazine named him National Public Official of the Year. And in 2015, he appeared on the Politico 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics. Whereas the U.S. Conference of Mayors elected him as their president in 2016, and its tireless efforts to bring professional sports to Oklahoma City led to the eventual arrival of our own Oklahoma City Thunder. Whereas following in the footsteps of the MAPS mayors, Mayor Cornette oversaw the completion of the MAPS for Kids and championed the passage of MAPS 3, garnering an unprecedented level of community involvement. Whereas Mayor Cornette took an unusual approach to public health by putting the entire city on a diet this outrageous challenge achieved worldwide notice and made better health and wellness outcomes a priority in Oklahoma City through people-centric urban design and innovative approaches to city-county health care and services. Whereas Mayor Cornett's optimistic outlook and pragmatic approach to governing has been an integral component of Oklahoma City's accession, he has represented Oklahoma City in a positive and forward-thinking manner on the national and international stage, reaching millions with his ever-confident take on Oklahoma City's future. 
Now therefore be it resolved by the council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Mayor Mick Cornett for his service to the city of Oklahoma City, first as a lifelong citizen, secondly as a council member, and finally as mayor for an incredible 14 years. Thank you. Mayor, I'm going to turn the microphone back to you for a few minutes, but then I'd like to invite any of the former members of the council, or Mayor Humphreys, as well as members of the council to say a few words. Okay. Well, um, boy, I've had a, my life has just been flashing before my eyes. You know, I, I uh, remember when I was giving that, that first speech, I'd just been elected mayor, and it was a group of civic leaders, and it was kind of a, a crowd about this size, and uh, my grandkids weren't here, but my kids were, and so I mean that just another uh, takeaway just um, of how many wonderful days I've had to, to, to be able to serve as mayor. Um, but I, I remember how I ended that speech, and uh, I I recalled that first generation that came to Oklahoma City and had the land run, and and you look at pictures of 1910, and you see what that first generation built. I mean, they built an entire city in 20 years. And we, uh, we tend to look around here and think we've done a lot. And I remember reminding people that, you know, that generation probably wasn't all that impressed with us, you know. What, what they had seen uh, coming from a prairie to a, to a cosmopolitan city um, was, was an, an amazing transformation and, and set this city on its path. And, but my challenge at the end of that speech was, let's, let's show that generation what we've got. And I'm extremely proud of what we what we've done over the last you know, 15 years, and um, perhaps as importantly or more importantly, what's coming. Um, my late father loved this city as as much as I did. Uh, served as a downtown postman for for many years, and he once told me that happiness is looking forward to something, having something to look forward to. And in this city, we've had something to look forward to now for about 25 years. And we keep planting seeds, and, and in Oklahoma City, you, you never have to talk about what we've done. You can always talk about what we're going to do. And I think that's extremely important when we're trying to attract people and job creators and keep this momentum going um, far off into the, into the future. Um, I, um, I remember um, seeing Marty Grubbs this morning, and as I mentioned before he gave the invocation, that. Um, he was really the first person I talked to about potentially entering politics. And, um, and what happened was I uh, was in the newsroom. I was anchoring the morning, noon, morning and noon newscast, and I had this gap in my schedule. And I went in and talked to my boss, and I, I asked her if I could go cover the state legislature between my two news anchoring positions. And I gave her all the reasons why it was a good idea. And she listened, and then she said, I want you to go cover City Hall. And I, I thought I was being punished for something. I didn't. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd been to City Hall, but I wasn't exactly sure how to get there. You know, I mean, you got to remember, back then, you didn't go downtown unless you had a reason to. And, there, and generally, there weren't all that many reasons to go down there. So I got directions, you know, remindful directions about how to get here and where to park. And I walked in, and I sat down right over there where we're Dennis Clowers is sitting today. And I didn't even know that the media was supposed to sit up there. I, I, just, I just wandered in. It was, like, it was like the third meeting before I ever turned around and found out that I was supposed to be up there. Um, but in that first meeting, something life-changing happened for me. I, I saw citizens standing right here, 10 feet in front of their elected officials, pleading their case and talking about whatever issue was important to them. And I love that immediacy. And I realized as I was kind of doing the self-examination of what I wanted to do with the next half of my professional career, 
I was wanting to make a difference, and I saw that City Hall was where a person could make a difference. And so it was you know, less than two years after that that I left television, um, ran for city council, and then uh, ultimately was um, elected mayor. Um, but I think one of the aspects that we have maintained, um, what I saw that day and what has been maintained since, is that there's, there's all sorts of inequities in the world. Um, um, people have different amounts of money, they have different opportunities, but once they enter this room, everybody's voice matters the same. Everybody has a voice, everybody has an opinion, and nobody's opinion is more important than anybody else's. And I've always been proud of this council, uh, before I was on it and after I've, I've been on it, that we listen to people and try to make the best decision for the citizens of Oklahoma City, um, keeping in mind that that, that that relationship between the citizen and the elected officials is extremely important. Um, you know, somebody has to make the agenda, and that's the city manager, and somebody has to run the meeting, that's the mayor. But everybody should be treated as an equal once they enter this room. And uh, I, as I leave office, I really feel proud that we've kept that going, because it doesn't feel like that's universal uh, throughout government or, or throughout uh, elected politics. Um, I want to thank my family. Um, you know, the, my, two of my granddaughters are here. They've, they've never known a day when they're grandfather wasn't the mayor, so um, they won't know what that feels like either. Um, my three sons were here. They were um, uh, in high school and college and just graduating uh, when, this, when this all took place um, 14 years ago. So um, certainly I've had, you know, personal growth and through that, through that opportunity, the, the ability to travel and talk about Oklahoma City story and uh, most of all learn from other cities uh, by example and try and bring some of those ideas back and, and figure out how we can, we can do better. Um, but I think I, I always, if you, if you realize you're always got to fall back on something. Um, I, my parents taught me to, to work hard, dream big, and give back. And um, the way that I've, I've chosen to lead is by reminding myself that we've got to continually raise our standards. And I've asked every board member, commission member, from time to time, you'll have an opportunity to raise the standards for what we do. Try and raise them, because we're not going to proceed as a city based on what the council and I do up here. We, we move forward many times based on boards and commissions and citizen input and creating higher standards for what it means to live in this city. And by those higher and higher standards, we have, um, by many ways, come further faster than any city in the United States history. So it's, it's, it's been fun to be along for the ride. Um, Terry, thank you so much for uh, uh, being patient when I wake up at 3 in the morning and have an idea. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she listens to it as opposed to uh, telling me to go back to sleep um, because that, that's probably going to continue to happen. Um, um, but, um, you know, when a person enters elected officials, elected office, they take their family with them. And, uh, and you know, it's, I always think it's easier on the elected official than it is those that care about them. Uh, because it can be very personal, and there's trying times, sure, um, but you know the the rewards are great, and certainly the opportunity to be the mayor of the city is is the opportunity of a lifetime for me. So, thank you all very much. As usual, that, that was, those were great comments, but hopefully you didn't speak too soon because we have to vote on that resolution now. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, it's unanimous. That's great. Well, thank you. And as count, former Councilman uh, Jerry Foshi says, we do have another presentation, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Jerry. Mick. Uh, I've served with you when you 
first came on council. He interviewed me when you were a reporter. Uh, I served under you being the mayor of Oklahoma City. I know it was challenging at times, but uh, and Kirk, I served under Kirk and Ron Norrie, so you know, served under all three mayors. And, I mean, everybody that has any idea of Oklahoma City understands what all you have done. I mean, I could go out of state. I'm, an, I'm a lawyer. If you don't like lawyers, I'm not a very good one. But uh, uh, you know, I go out of state. I meet people out of state. They always ask about you. What? How, how are you doing? How, how are you motivated? How do you get these various groups to work together when they can't get their own people to work together? So you've done an outstanding job. And, and I just now heard you took second in the world as the best mayor. Who beat you out? Superman? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but South Oklahoma City, uh, you've been a friend to me. You've been a friend to Oklahoma City. And you've certainly been a friend to South Oklahoma City. So in recognition of everything that you've done in our city and making this a place, I can remember when we first start, started the MAPS project, if you saw somebody here after 6 o'clock, you knew they were working with them. There wasn't anybody downtown. Now you fight for parking spots. You know, there's something going on all the time. So the, the metamorphosis that you've changed the city over the years, and Kirk and, and Ron North and, and has changed Dad's going to see. When I was the first took the council, there was two hotels. That was it. And you couldn't get conventions in because there was no place to keep them. So uh, you've done wonders. And uh, uh, this is a <coughs> presented by the South Kent Chamber. It's a certificate of recognition. It says, and, uh, is hereby uh, certificate of recognition is hereby awarded to Mick Cornett for great Mayor, before everyone leaves, we would like to take a moment just to see if there's any comments from anyone, any members of the council who'd like to say anything at this time. It has been an honor and a privilege to work with you the last three years. Um, we are all very, very proud of your accomplishments, not only uh, what we know about here in the city, but across the United States and all over the world. Um, Winston Churchill. I uh, once said the difference between making a living and making a life is public surface. And you have made a life for yourself and you have made a city. We are very, very proud of you. Uh, Debbie and I are honored to call you and Terry our friends and we treasure that friendship. And Debbie said to tell me that with all the spare time you have on your hands now, she hopes you find a lot to do. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I will have to say that it has been a joy and pleasure to work with you. Uh, these past five years. When, when I think about you've been uh, elected official for 17 years, I get to calculate and, and uh, I was 18 <laughs> years old when you um, became, first became a uh, councilman and then uh, later became uh, mayor. Uh, it's fun to uh, go around Oklahoma City to say, hey, you know, the mayor lives in Ward 7. Um, but it has, again, been a joy and pleasure to uh, work side by side with you. And I appreciate everything that you have done in support of uh, the city and in support of um, everyone uh, who says and who lives uh, within the city of Oklahoma City. And thank you to your family members. Um, I know it's, 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 it's hard um, on um, elected officials' family, um, and your family has uh, stood by you, uh, and that says a lot. Thank you. I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, Mick, we've been colleagues for a long time, but we've been friends a lot longer, and that means so very much to me. Um, Marty Grubbs may have been the first person that you talked to about this race, but there was a small group of citizens um, anxious to support good government that gathered in my library in 2000 and had you come talk to us about your political ambitions. And from then on, we 
signed letters and stuffed envelopes and are so proud of the service that you've provided for all these many years. It has been an incredible opportunity to serve with you. Uh, I think you mentioned some time ago that you'd looked through some photographs and seen how many just momentous things we all around this horseshoe have been able to participate in and um, your leadership just shines through. So thank you for that and we all wish you the very best success in the future. Mayor, I just, I want to thank you again for your leadership uh, and for you making me feel welcome as I transitioned onto the council. I have something I probably need to admit and apologize for. Um, my wife's name is Mary Ann and my phone, she's listed as Mayor, M-A-R-E. <laughs> and I have another listing in there as Mayor. And uh, occasionally when I try to do the voice dial thing, it'll pull up the wrong mayor, so uh, if you get a call from me wanting to know if there's errands I need to run on the way to the house, you'll understand. Uh, but in the future, I look forward to changing that to the governor. So I wish you all the best, thank you. We hear a lot these days about diversity and unity, and there's a diversity on this council with Mick and I that um, a lot of people don't know. I was born and raised in New Jersey as a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and for some reason our mayor became a New York Giant fan and is now a San Francisco Giant fan. But we've been able to come together and uh, under his leadership and uh, help uh, move this city forward. And thank you, Mayor, for your friendship, your loyalty, and for all your commitment to Oklahoma City. May God bless you. Ditto to everything that's been said, but I, 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 I wanna thank you and my, my family wants to thank you for everything you've done for our city. Uh, it, it truly is remarkable. And we wish you the best in all of your future endeavors. Yeah. All right, on the council agenda, we're on item three. Um, we'll need a motion for item three A, C, D, and E. And I'll, I'll note uh, that uh, Councilwoman Salyer will be serving as vice mayor for the next six months, and Councilman Pettis will take over a one-year uh, position as being the council representative on the MAPS 3 Citizen Advisory Board. So thanks to both of you for your service there. Is there a motion? Move the item second. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 3F and G and H need to be moved into executive session. Can we do that with one vote or no, do we need we separate? separate? All right, how about a motion then on 3F to move it into executive session? Executive session. Cast your votes, it passes unanimously. Item 3G. Move to executive session. Cast your votes, it moves to executive session. And item 3H. Move to executive session. Cast your votes, it passes unanimously. Item four is the Journal of Council Proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for March 13th, and 4B is to approve the journal for February 27th. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item five is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, today we have a few starting on page 22 under item X, uh, I1. Item E, 304 Northwest 80th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has removed. Uh, item, then moving to item 9J1. Item A, 3508 South Agnew. We ask that that be stricken. The owner secured. Item E, 2100 Northwest 27th Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. 
Item I, 2505 Southeast 49th Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And item M, 1221 Northwest 96th Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Moving to page 23, under nine, items 9K1, nine item A, 3508 South Agnew, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item I, 2100 Northwest 27th Street, we ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item M, 2505 Southeast 49th Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And finally, item Q, 1221 Northwest 96th Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, we'll move on to item six. These are revocable permits. And our first is a request from the Arts Council of Oklahoma City to hold the Festival of the Arts, April 24th. And here comes Peter DeLisi. Good morning, Peter. Remind me how many years the Arts Council of Oklahoma has been doing the Festival of the Arts? This is the 52nd. Congratulations. That's, that's Thank tremendous. You. We brought you some posters. We'll leave them up here for you all. Okay. Here on behalf of myself personally and certainly the Arts Council of Oklahoma City, we want to thank you so much for all your service and support of the arts through the years. It's really been remarkable how you've always helped bolster it. Every time I come up here to speak, you've always done a wonderful job of making sure everybody knows that they can park down here and, <laughs> and remind them of the different things that I might forget to say. And I've, I've really appreciated uh, the feeling of inclusion that we've had in everything that you've done. Uh, 52nd Annual Festival of the Arts, it's just incredible. Uh, we'll be moving in about 120 tons of steel uh, on April the 13th. Uh, eight 53-foot trailers will come in, bringing all the rest of the equipment. Uh, we spend about a week setting up the event. Uh, rather uh, extensive infrastructure that we put together for it. Uh, all culminating with the festival beginning on April the 24th, running through April the 29th. And I want to invite everyone on the council to come to opening ceremonies, which is at 11 o'clock on April the 24th. And then after opening ceremonies, we have the official luncheon, where we'll have festival foods from the 29 different food vendors. We'll uh, be supporting you with some wonderful food items, uh, just to sort of welcome everyone and celebrate uh, the opening of Festival of the Arts. That's terrific. April 24th through the 29th? Yes, sir. And uh, as you, you reminded that I usually remind people, plenty of parking <laughs> uh, when, when, you, when you come downtown, especially if you're coming after hours or on weekends, uh, and be part of the Festival of the Arts. Come for the food, come for the art, uh, but it's, it's always one of the highlights of the season. So Peter, thank you and everybody on your volunteer staff that makes all this possible. Well, we really appreciate you, and we really appreciate you, Mr. Couch, and everything that your city departments bring to the table. It's just incredible the support we get from everyone that works for the city of Oklahoma City. And it's, it's just a remarkable event. We couldn't do it without you. How about a motion? So Festival moved. of the Arts. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thanks, Thank Peter. Thank you so much. Huh. All right, our second request is from McNelly's to hold the McNelly's pub, pub run. And Emily White is here. Come on up, Emily. Good Tell morning. us about the pub rub. Uh, this is our eighth year for our charity pub run. We're raising money for Positive Tomorrows. Uh, we have a one mile fun run, but for people who really like to run, you can run four miles. And if you want to get really adventurous, you can chug three beers along the route. Um, it's a good time. Uh, we're raising money for a really great charity. Thank you for, for putting all this together. How can people sign up? You can sign up actually through our Facebook page. It's the easiest. There's a big event picture. Just click on it. It'll take you right to the event sign up. Um, and we've moved a little earlier this year, hoping for a little bit cooler weather mm -hmm. and to not interfere with anyone's graduation plans. All right. So it'll be April 14th. April 14th. And um, as, as you said, it benefits positive tomorrows. Really appreciate it. How Thank about a motion? So moved. Second. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Item C is a request with the Plaza District to hold live on the Plaza. Looks like we have some representatives of the Plaza District. Good morning, ladies. We will need your name and address for the record. Sure. Uh, my name is Selena Scorman. I'm at 303 Northeast 3rd Street, number 301, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73104. Okay. 
And my name is Natalie Evans, and I am at 11733 North Meridian Place, Apartment A, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73162. All right, tell us about Live on the Plaza. Oh, I've, happily. Uh, we've got Live on the Plaza. It's the uh, Plaza District Art Walk. It's the second Friday of every month. And uh, it's just your friendly neighborhood block party. There's live music, shopping, food trucks, uh, and special performances. Uh, on behalf of the Plaza District Association, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your continued support of Live on the Plaza. It's been going on for 10 years and counting. Our next one is Friday, April 13th, and it's got a Earth Day theme celebrating all things green and sustainable. We'll have spokies, we'll have an upcycle fashion show. It's in partnership with Oklahoma City Beautiful and Keep Oklahoma Beautiful. And we'll have our artist market there. So we hope to see you guys there either on in April or in any other of the upcoming months. So thank you. Bet. Thank so you guys so very much. For second all Friday of every month between uh, now and uh, December. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much. How about a motion? Move approval. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Good luck. All right. Item 6D is a request from the University of Oklahoma Community Health Alliance to hold the OU HSC Health Dash. Is there anyone here from the OU Health Science Center? This is in Ward 7. John, you want to make the motion? All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item 6E is a request with Whiskey Chicks Parlor LLC to have the Whiskey Chicks Patio, which is a, a patio service. It's on East Reno down there near the canal. That's also in Ward 7. John? All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. All right, is there any comments or questions on the MFA? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Three items. All right, we have a motion and a second. Comments or questions on the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Three items. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, are there any individual considerations? Mayor, I did just want to mention 7Q. All right, Meg, why don't you get started with Q? Sure, I, I can't find my note, but I just wanted to recognize this is the very, very important <laughs> step for the uh, downtown park. We'll be issuing the RFQ, which is our RFP, which is the request for proposals for the public art piece um, that is required under our 1% for art ordinance. Um, this project, because of its scope and size, has a budget of a half a million dollars and will be located right at what everybody seems to call the hard corner at uh, uh, Robinson and the Boulevard. It will become one of the most iconic um, features, I think, in Oklahoma City. And so it's really exciting to put out this call and receive the suggestions of artists from around the country and perhaps around the world that want to participate in Oklahoma City's growth and development. So I want to thank Robbie Kinzel for our arts and culture liaison for shepherding this process. It's hard and complicated and lots of procedure involved, but we're really excited about coming up with a great suggestion for Oklahoma City. Agreed. All right, ready to vote the consent docket? We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, on to the concurrence docket. Move those items subject to individual consideration. Any comments on the concurrence docket? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Move on to item nine. This begins a series of items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. The first is an ABC issue in Ward 3, 
at 6801 Southwest 3rd Street. Larry? Uh, yes, Your Honor. This is a expansion of a, of a facility, a restaurant to allow them to serve alcohol. Uh, it was passed unanimously by the Planning Commission. Has anybody signed up? Seeing nobody to sign up, unless there are questions from the council, I move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A1. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A2 is an ABC issue in Ward 2 at 5900 North May Avenue. Is anyone here rec uh, representing that effort? Okay. And unless Ed has given instructions to one of the council people, I'll just ask for a motion, then it's... All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A3 is a zoning case in Ward 7. It's at 2101 East Grand Boulevard. It's currently R4 General Residential, and it's in a PUD, and it would become uh, I3 Heavy Industrial if approved. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, anyone signed up to speak? I see the applicant uh, is uh, present. The Planning Commission did move for, they did recommend for approval. I move for approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9A3. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A4 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 6900 North Santa Fe Avenue. It's currently R1 single family residential and it'd be put into a new PUD if approved. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Clerk. Anyone signed up to speak? No one signed up to speak. Um, I do want to um, publicly thank the applicant for working um, uh, things out with uh, the neighborhood. Um, I know it was a long process and so I just wanna say again, thank you. Uh, for working with uh, the neighborhood. The neighborhood uh, is excited about this development, so I just want to, uh, again, thank you uh, to the applicant. Um, with that said, I move for approval. All right, we're voting on 9A4. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A5 is a zoning case in Ward 3 at 520 North Meridian Avenue. It's currently I-2 Moderate Industrial and it would be put into a new simplified plan unit development if approved. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I see the applicant. If you'd like to come forward and just give a few comments to the council of what you intend to do. Yes, sir. Thank you. My, my name is Brad Stump, and I own a business called Brewers Union. We are a brewing incubator uh, and provide a foundation for small and early stage startup breweries. Um, my property, or actually, I'm not the property owner, just the uh, tenant but the property is currently zoned I-2, and we would like the ability to add a tap room to that property in addition to the manufacturing brewing facility. Thank you, sir. Uh, unless there are questions, it was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. Unless any of the council have uh, questions, I move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A5. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thanks, good luck. Item 9A6 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 2527 Northwest 179th Street. It's currently R1 single family residential and it will be put into a new spud if approved. Mark? Thank you, Your Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing. It went before the Planning Commission in February and was approved. Uh, I'm aware of no one uh, objecting to this ordinance and so I'd move for its approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9A6. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9B is an amendment to the comprehensive plan. Um, makes a slight change in the ty typology. Is that a right? Is that the right word? Typology? That's right. <laughs> yes. Not a word in my regular vocabulary. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Aubrey McDermott, Planning Director. Wanted to give you a little background on this uh, request to amend the comprehensive plan. This uh, request came from an applicant who is seeking to rezone a piece of land in Oklahoma City southwest of the intersection of Northwest 122nd and North County Line La Road. Their uh, application was to develop single family uh, subdivision in this area. So go to the next slide, I'll show you. This is our land use typology map. And these typologies have been designated to try to uh, help uh, manage growth as it happens in Oklahoma City, but the, put uh, compatible uses together. As you can see from the legend on this, we have certain things we call layers of land use typology. And some of those layers are meant to uh, identify properties that are good for intensification or concentrations of specific types of uses. The area that this was designated was in the employment reserve um, layer. 
underneath that layer exists the urban low intensity land use typology. And we'll talk about the difference between those two things. So this is the area of the amendment again west of County Line Road in a uh, section of the employment reserve which is the hatched uh, blue lines. The next slide explains why it was designated as that. Uh, back in 2012, the city and the Chamber of Commerce did a study called the Employment Lands Needs Assessment and Action Plan, which identified parcels in Oklahoma City that were large enough in size to be able to accommodate large employment uses like office, commercial, industrial, um, office park, looking for development ready sites that may be uh, close with access to the interstate corridors. This was one of the sites that that study identified and the comprehensive plan prior to this one and this one um, held that designation. So you can see from the aerial that this was largely undeveloped. Uh, next to it is residential development that's happened and the site, if you'll go ahead and switch to the zoning map, is zoned AA and to the east of it is zoned R1 with a single family subdivision. Uh, this site also is uh, within range to extend water and wastewater services to be developed. And go to the next slide, you can see that it, it has a, a rural response time adjacent and next to an urban response time. So with all of those factors, the Planning Commission considered this application, if you go to the next slide, and looked at it through the lens of the urban low intensity land use designation in terms of developing a single family subdivision here. It did meet the requirements for the urban low intensity, which allows many different types of land use to exist, including single family residential. Uh, it tries to support single family residential subdivisions that are four to eight dwelling units per acre, and it is uh, within water and wastewater service areas. So on February 8th, the Planning Commission approved this amendment, which removes the layer of, herb, of uh, employment reserve and designated it as urban low intensity. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, and we're here to ask that you receive the amendment. Aubrey, why the little teeny cutout? Is that just a piece of property that someone else owns? It must be outside of the ownership of the development of, this, of the subdivision. Okay. All right, we're ready to vote on item 9B1. I, and I've, I got a comment about just that whole Kilpatrick Turnpike corridor. I mean, I, I think that you know, as you're driving along that Kilpatrick, I mean, there's residential everywhere along the Kilpatrick and to me I don't know why anybody would want to live right next to the turnpike and so in the future I mean keeping some of this stuff as as commercial or employment reserve or industrial or something like that certainly in my mind makes a lot of sense because uh, I, I mean I, I, I mean you can see down into their backyards I, I I would never want to live in that house, even though it's a nice house and everything. But um, to me, some of these things that we have put into the comp plan, uh, and, and obviously this doesn't back up right right to the to the to the turnpike, so it, it's not the exact thing what I'm describing. But um, I would just be careful. I'm sure the planning commission uh, is aware of all that, but I, I just wanted to because because I, I drive on Kilpatrick quite a bit there, so. Right, there Just was that I'd... discussion okay. about the remaining employment reserve area and how the comprehensive plan does have protections in it for if, if those remaining areas that are designated employment reserve between the single family subdivision and the turnpike were ever developed, the comp plan's protections would um, help guide that development to transition to more compatible types of employment uses, lower density office. So if, for example, even though employment reserve would allow an industrial type use to exist within it, it wouldn't be appropriate right up next to a subdivision. So the remaining piece of employment reserve is still in place today. And, and once the Kilpatrick Turnpike makes the turn to the east, all the development starts looking like what you would expect along a turnpike. Mm -hmm. But then when it turns back going south, some mm -hmm. of it like, why, why is that there? You know, so. And it, just for purpose of the record, I would say that this land does not back up to the turnpike. It's a ways from it. And I would move that we receive the resolution that was adopted by the planning department, planning commission. All right, we're voting on item 9B1. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then item 9B2 is here for a final hearing, and it's a, I guess a, a similar item, but it has to do with the county line road being changed from a double A to R1 single family. Is there anyone here representing this effort? 
Yeah, David, what's going on here? Sure, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, on behalf of the applicant who's also here. Uh, this is uh, an associated item, so this is the rezoning request. Um, we appeared before the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission recommended uh, that they remove the, the employment reserve layer, um, leaving what is now the urban low. And so with that is the associated rezoning case from AA to R1. Ultimately, this was uh, recommended for approval unanimously by Planning Commission. It is uh, adjacent to R1 on the north, adjacent to R1 on the east. The prevailing land use pattern in this area is R1 single family. Um, there is an individual that expressed some concerns. So we will have to plat this and we'll go back before the Planning Commission. One of the concerns that he raised was drainage. This is in an area in which detention is not required. Uh, but seeing that the concern was raised, we have agreed to uh, provide detention within our plat and that will be approved at the uh, Planning Commission stage in which you'll have the opportunity to, to appear. So um, we've tried our best to, to meet with him and, and you know, hear the concerns and do what we can to, to satisfy them. And um, we will continue to work with him as we move forward. Mayor, we've had several meetings on this and, and the, the drainage was one issue and um, the developer has been willing to go beyond the uh, requirements of the ordinance and put in two detention ponds and um, that seemed to uh, satisfy the person that was protesting uh, as at least to a portion of his uh, protest. And um, I would say that uh, there's been meetings with engineers, there's been meetings with lawyers, and there's been meetings with landowners, and uh, I think we've worked hard to move this thing forward, and I'd move for the ordinance's adoption. All right, we're voting on item 9B2. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's been a pleasure appearing before you, being the only mayor I've known since I've been out in private <laughs> practice, so good luck with your next ventures. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, item 9C is uh, closing an easement in Ward 8. Mark, you okay with this? Yes, Your Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing. It's an easement that's associated with Chisholm Creek. It was approved by the Planning Commission, and I'd move for the ordinance's adoption. All right, we're voting on item 9C. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9D uh, would repeal an ordinance which uh, closes a street right away in Ward 7. John, you okay with this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9D. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9E is a public hearing. It has to do with the water assessment district that we're uh, creating in Ward 8. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on this item today? All right. How about, uh, Mark, you want to say anything or move a motion to move it forward? But the, the only thing I'd say quickly is that this is an improvement district that was created pursuant to Title 11, and it's where the homeowners uh, needed to uh, address an issue concerning their water, and, and I applaud them uh, for coming together and, and coming up with the improvement district, and this will adopt and set the assessment role uh, to those homeowners to pay for this water main, so um, I'd move for it to the ordinance approval. All right, it's a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9E2. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. That sets the assessment roll for that water district. Item 9F, we're selling some bonds today. Have they sold yet? Uh, they're putting the numbers together. Okay. The, the bids came, they're, they're not quite ready to go, but the bids came in. We've got 11 bids on each of the two, uh, the taxables and the non-taxables. We've got great, very, very competitive rates. But if we could just put that off for a few more minutes as they're okay. finally putting those numbers together. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll just skip item 9F and G for right now. We'll come back to those. All right, <laughs> item 9H, Bob Tiener is here for an item that's being introduced today. Uh, just briefly, this ordinance is proposed to bring our ordinance into conformance with state law relating to the uh, occupational tax for alcoholic beverages. Uh, back in 16, state law was amended. It allows convenience stores and uh, grocery stores to start selling strong beer and uh, wine and this amendment will allow us to do an interim license uh, the ordinance goes into effect where they can start selling October 1st but what they'd like to do the businesses would like to be able to start stocking the product do any improvements to their stores so they'll be ready to sell on October 1st and so that's what this ordinance is doing and allowing us to do an interim permit I answer any questions. All right. Item is just being introduced today. We'll set a public hearing for April 10th, and it is scheduled final adoption for April 24th. So how about a motion to allow it to be introduced today? 
Cash your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, item 9i is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9i? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9j is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9j? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9K is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9K? Second. All right. Yes. Okay. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right. Do we have the results in on the bond issue sale? Okay. All right. We're on to item 9L then, and this would uh, confirm the financing plan on the convention center. Now, this is um, the next step in the process for the financing of the Convention Center Hotel. Um, it's the implementation of another step in the funding plan that you approved in July of 2017 and also helps us meet the requirements in the redevelopment agreement that we have with Omni Hotels. Um, the item before you today authorizes up to $106 million in financing but the, the amount will ultimately be determined by the structure of the financing. We think it will be um, considerably less than that. Also, the resolution provides for an agreement of support from the city, um, which commits the city to provide financial support to the Economic Development Trust should the revenues in the funding plan not materialize. So this is the, the moral obligation um, pledge that we make on many of our economic development bond issues. All right, cast your votes. Eight zero. Thank you, Kathy. Item 9H. Um, where are we? I didn't change my page. You'd think I'd figure out how to do this by now. 9M. Uh, this is to modify our financial policies, and uh, Doug Dowler is going to come in and present for us? Hopefully. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Sorry about that the delay there. Uh, on the agenda today is a, an amendment or is a resolution amending our budget and financial pol planning policies that's contained uh, in your packet. And it also contains uh, the proposed policies as Exhibit A. In addition, we've included a strike through version of the policy so you can easily see the changes being proposed. And finally, for reference, we've included our current policies. So our current policies were adopted seven years ago. Last year, we began a review of our policies to see what needed updating. And at the Council workshop last month, we discussed the significant changes being considered. Uh, some of the key aspects in the policy that are not changing in the current policy include uh, the requirement that we have a balanced budget, the prohibition of borrowing for operations, the inclusion of departments in the budget process, and the requirement to prepare a five-year financial forecast. Each of these remains unchanged in the proposed policy. Likewise, the ability to approve transfers administratively and to report on, uh, to Council on those transfers do not change in the current policy. And the current policy does not mention the five-year uh, capital improvement projects plan. The proposed policy uh, includes our current practice of preparing a five-year capital plan every other year. Uh, the current policy states the city will make efforts to uh, increase general fund spending for capital. The proposed policy sets a target for capital maintenance funding of 1 to 3 percent of the general fund budget. Capital maintenance has been an area we've often cut back during tight budget times, and we wanted to add an explicit statement in the proposed policy about the importance of maintaining city assets and adequately funding projects to ensure city facilities and equipment are taken care of. The current policy is silent about revenues, and the proposed policy sets a goal of maintaining a diversified mix of revenues and that fees for services that provide direct benefits should recover the full cost of that service. And then the current policy does not address retirement contributions, and the proposed policy uh, notes the city's commitment to fund retirement contributions as required by state law and city ordinance. Now, probably the most significant change is the proposed in the proposed policy is to raise the level of operating reserve in the general fund from
from our current 8 to 15 percent range to 14 to 20 percent. This range was originally proposed at 12 to 20 percent, but based on the comments from the council at the workshop, we've raised that level to 14 to 20 percent uh, in the policy that you have before you. For most other operating funds, the current range is 5 to 10 percent, and the proposed policy just raises the top end of that range to 20 percent. So why are we proposing an increase in the range for operating reserve? The, the primary reason is the Government Finance Officers Association recommends cities maintain no less than two months of uh, worth of expenses, or about 16.7 percent in unreserved fund balance. This recommended minimum is above our current range of 8 to 15 percent. And the reasons for maintaining a higher level of fund balance are, are pretty straightforward. It provides reserve to draw on in emergencies. It allows the city to take deliberate actions during a recession rather than having to take short-term knee-jerk steps that may not be the best decisions in the long run. And finally, a higher level of reserves provides a fallback in the event of unexpected revenue disruptions. So with this year's budget, the 14 to 20 percent range would be from about 57 to 81 million dollars. And we began this year with an unbudgeted reserve of nearly 64 million dollars, or about 15.7 percent. Uh, one of the things that was requested at the council workshop was a review of kind of what other cities have as their policy. So we surveyed another number of cities in the region to compare their policies. As you can see, the minimum levels of operating reserve range from 5 percent in St. Louis to 16 percent in Bartlesville, 17 percent in Tucson. Uh, you'll note St. Louis, Tucson, and Edmond actually began the year below their minimum policy uh, level. When we look at um, AAA-rated cities, you'll see that the minimum is at 8 percent at Virginia Beach with a high of 16 percent in Charlotte, North Carolina. And all of these cities began the year above their minimum level. I would note that all of these cities can use property tax for operations, and property tax is a more stable source of revenue, so the rating agencies often take that into account when judging how much reserve a city should maintain. So that's just kind of a quick overview of what's in the policy, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. All right, questions for Doug? Uh, Doug, I did have just one quick question. In the um, policies that remain unchanged, is the contingency of 2% in our general fund budget? That right, we, that, but we set that as a target to, to, to try to maintain 2%. Um, at the end of our fiscal year, if there are funds remaining in that contingency area, do we roll those over or do we move those for right, indefinite? Right, right. Just, just as any other sort of expenditure that, that's not made would roll into fund balance that would that be carried over to the next year. Great. But, it, but the budget would not be increased for that amount. It would just be available as unreserved fund balance. Right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are any other questions for Doug? All right. Doug, thank you. Uh, we need a motion then on 9M. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9N is our collective bargaining agreement with the firefighters. A motion. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Just a, a moment to uh, extend our appreciation to all the firefighters. And um, it's nice to be able to do a little bit better this year on, on salaries, and they have had great patience through the years working with us, but uh, I don't think you should complete a process like this without saying thank you, because their willingness to go to work and do the things that they do for us are very, very appreciated. All right, let's look at um, item 9O. Understand we do not need executive session. That's correct. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 9P, understand we do not need executive session. Correct. Is there a motion? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9Q, understand we do not need executive session. Correct. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9R, uh, we do not need executive session. Correct. Okay, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9S, I understand we do not need executive session. Right. Is there a motion? Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9T, I understand we do need executive session. Yes. All right. Cast your votes. And that item moves to executive session. Item 9U is claims recommended for denial. And uh, one person has signed up to speak. Eric Fisher. Hey, good morning. Eric, what can you tell me about the, the, uh, the claim? Well, sir, I have a speech that I'd like to make. Okay. Yeah, sure. 
How long of a speech is it? Uh, well, sir, um, I've, I've, they said it was it was a three minute egg, so I'm going to have to shorten it up. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I, Eric Fisher, file 18.54, believe the following statement to be true to the best of my knowledge. I am a loyal resident of Oklahoma City since 1989. I've been a resident at 14509 Briarcliff Drive, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73170, Cleveland County, for approximately 10 years. I'm a father of three young boys, Dylan, Nathan, and Noah, ages 11, 5, and 2. I am a 100% disabled American veteran for physical and invisible injuries. The Department of Veteran, Veteran Affairs accepted my application for injuries acquired during combat. I have been in the status of 100% DAV since June 13th, 2013. Unfortunately, I'm in the process of an ongoing legal proceedings for damages not replaced by the insurance company and construction company. For the past five years, I've endured extreme stress and mental st anguish beyond the, my control through catastrophic events. On Friday, February 17, 2017, I was falsely accused of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Upon arrest on my driveway, Oklahoma City police officers pointed their guns at me and told me to get on the ground. I complied without incident. The arresting officer handcuffed me as I was lying on the ground. The officer picked me up halfway in the air by my hands that were cuffed. He pulled, me, he pulled out all my belongings and out of my pockets and slammed me back on the concrete of the surface of the driveway on my left hip. I have extending pre-existing injuries from combat to both rotor cuffs and left hip. I was in excruciating pain after being slammed on my left hip. One of the state witnesses was using the cell phone recording of their arrest. The recording should be subpoenaed as evidence. After I told the officer that he hurt me and I needed medical attention, the officer stated that he didn't hurt me. Instead, he made fun of me, stating the so-called victim was DIA, the neighbor of the northwest corner of my house of Briar Briarcliff Drive, who was in fact a U.S. Air Marshal working in Ukraine, was a KGB agent, and he himself was a mercenary. I was booked in the Oklahoma County Jail. I was placed in a holding area with other people in handcuffs. A detention officer came in and said, Eric Fisher. I stood up and said, that's me. The detention officer said, anyone that does not know their own name must have a mental disorder. I was not wearing my hearing aids, and I did not hear my name being called from a separate room. I was told to stand forward to take my mugshot. I complied with the first picture taken successfully. I was told to stand in the right, in which I did comply. The detention officer told me that I was not doing it right, or words of that effect, and I told him, he told me to inch more to the left, no to the right, then took several mug shots. Finally, in frustration, I stood forward, looking to the left and frowning, asking which way do I need to stand. The detention officer took another picture of me facing forward, and that is the mugshot they used to build a case against me. I was given paperwork and a code for a one minute phone call. The detention officer placed me in solitary confinement until all the other inmates were processed. I spoke to a nurse who asked if I had any mental problems. I expressed to her that the question, that question is doctor client privilege. I told her the arresting officer hurt my left hip and both shoulders. The handcuffs were on so long and tight that my hands were purple and numb. The intelligence officer with the body camera evidence that took me to Oklahoma County Jail will confirm that my hands were purple. The nurse replied by stating that it sure would be easier for me if I would just say that I had a mental disorder. At this point, I became furious. While talking to the nurse, I was asking the detention officer if I could eat since I didn't have supper. He told me that a vending machine was around the corner as he laughed, as all my property was taken and I was handcuffed. If at any point of their arrest and the officers, detention officers and the nurse of Oklahoma County Jail had reason to believe that I had a mental disorder, then I should have been taken immediately to a medical professional to be evaluated at a hospital, which was never done by authorities. I was placed into, back into solitary confinement past midnight and finally allowed a sandwich. I changed into some orange jumpsuit and given one blanket. Two other inmates were sleeping on their own racks and I was forced to sleep on a cold concrete floor next to the toilet. I had pre-existing conditions to my neck, back, and ankles. While being on lockdown for 24 hours a day without a shower, I tried to use the phone code given to me that, with the pain phone in the jail cell. The phone was broken and I was not able to call anyone to include my family or my attorney. I was awoken every hour on the hour by detention officers knocking on the jail cell door during their hourly checks. By Tuesday, February 21st, 2017, I was in extreme pain. I was extremely sleep deprived and during extreme mental stress and anguish while under duress during the fact that I had no contact with my family, my attorney or bail bondsman. Approximately 9 a.m., Detective Locke 
Wynn of the Oklahoma City Police Department interviewed me about what happened on Friday, February 17, 2017. Please listen to a short clip between Detective Wynn and myself regarding bail and jurisdiction. This is the exact moment Detective Wynn realized that I was in the wrong county. At the time, Detective Wynn neglected to let me know that I had a $7,500 bail that was set and a search warrant was signed by a Oklahoma County judge. Instead, Detective Wynn retyped a new search warrant on or about February 21st, 2017 and rushed it to be signed by a Cleveland County judge. Detective Wynn did a great job inserting Cleveland County throughout the new search warrant. However, he ne neglected to replace in the District of Oklahoma County in the upper left-hand corner of the first page. On the second page, you will clearly see that is the page from the original search warrant or probable cause affidavit that does not match up with any page at all. The page is a continuation of a page that no longer exists. On the third page, you will see that a bail was made by Judge Stice of Cleveland County for $50,000 and defendant to be brought to CCJE by 9 a.m. on February 22, 2017, if not held on other charges. The bail was set so high to ensure I was not uh, that I would stay in jail violating the Eighth Amendment right of excessive bail. On the fourth page is a return and inventory of evidence collected by police officers February 17th with different charges of brandishing a weapon and appointing a weapon on February 23, 2017. The argument with the search warrant is that Detective Wynn did in fact alter a search warrant Judge Stice did, in fact, sign an altered search warrant on or about February 21st, then backdated it to February 17, 2017. Where is the original search warrant signed by the Oklahoma County judge who set the bail at $7,500? On or about February 21st, 2017, Oklahoma City police officers re-entered my locked residence by executing a second altered search warrant. My property was destroyed during the execution of the second search warrant and the house was left unlocked. The people of Oklahoma have a Fourth Amendment right of reasonable search and seizures. The shed was, did not need to be destroyed. The key was in the kitchen drawer of the potholders and the rest of my keys, That, if they would have asked. Police officers picked up my recliner from the front with excessive force, destroying the leg rest, slamming the rear of the recliner to the wall, ripping and tearing the back of the recliner and causing damage to the wall. My coffee table and side tables in the living room were slammed into the wood floors, causing destruction to the furniture and floors. A rotating stand fan was taken out of my son's room and thrown across the living room, destroying the fan. Assistant Municipal Counsel Tina A. Hughes will suggest denying the claim because Oklahoma City is not liable for damages during a search warrant. As an example, if police officers poured gasoline all over my house and lit the house on fire, would the example of the police officer's actions be arson or claim liability never occurred due to the execution of a search warrant was within the scope of their duties and have immunity? The same effect is that off police officers did destroy private property based on an altered search warrant and false police report does not meet reasonable search and seizure. Destroying furniture and a truck panel is not reasonable search. Ms. Hughes will describe proximate and legal causation that the city employees shall not be liable under the Governmental Tort Claims Act. I have been falsely accused of a crime by the so-called victim by making the false police report. I have not been convicted of the charges. I do not have an interest in filing a governmental tort claim against Oklahoma City, a city that I, that I love. I am hereby requesting an executive investigation of the Oklahoma City Criminal Division, Oklahoma and Cleveland County District Attorney's Office, and Oklahoma and Cleveland County Judge's Office. 
The, judges, the justice system is designed to seek the truth. Instead, based on a false police report by the so-called victim, I am persecuted for prosecuted by a corrupted legal pro process. Please conduct a proper internal investigation. All institutions have immunity of the law that as I, that I as a private citizen may not legally sue in a civil court. Misconduct and corruption need to be fully investigated at a higher political level. A system of checks and balances are vital. Thank you, members of the Oklahoma City Council, for allowing me to address this meeting. All right. Thanks, Eric. Tina, can you come up? You can sit down. Yes, sir. This is, this is a claim for property damage during the search. Um, we have photos, which I didn't bring copies of here, but we have them on a disc, showing that the condition of his property before and after the search doesn't show that damage. Um, we also know that our officers found those keys that were hidden in the drawer, used them to open the truck and look in there and close the truck back so they didn't damage the truck. They had a warrant based on a police report that a gun was being brandished about at neighbors and the guys working on the AC next door. So we showed up on that. He went inside his house, stayed there for a while. We were getting a search warrant. He came out, he was arrested. The search warrant was used. It gave us the right to check the house, the yard, anything on the property. During that search, we located weapons and drugs. Um, I don't, anything that happened at the jail afterward, we don't run the jail. We didn't have anything to do with that. The reports that we take are based on statements by people in the neighborhood, in this case. Um, indications to us were that that was true, probably. Um, our job is to uh, enforce the law. Uh, he was arrested and taken to the county jail. Chief City informs me that we take all of our arrests to the Oklahoma County Jail, notify the other counties if they need to come get them and they would come and get him at that point. Uh, anything that happened in the jail, not us. We don't operate a jail. The, the claim, you say that's for items that were uh, alleged to have been damaged during the, the search? Yes, sir. Is, is, I don't remember a case coming to, to us before in, on, on this type of an issue. Is this an unusual case in that regard? It's not totally unique, but it is unusual. And you were saying it sounded like by policy that the officers are to take a picture of the scene before they conduct the search and then another one afterwards? Or I'm not absolutely certain if that's the policy or not. It's not the policy, but they did that in this case. Okay. There's a specific exemption for the provision of police protection. We were called out because somebody was supposed to have a gun threatening people. Um, that's police protection. Mm-hmm. Everything else flowed out of well, that. Well, are you, are you suggesting that, that state law does not allow the council the discretion to pay this claim, or are we still subject to, to, the, you know, the, the, to our discretion on, on whether or not we think the city is liable? I believe the initial arrest was certainly covered by provision of police protection exemption. If we had evidence that the police had done something outside the scope of their employment, like pour gasoline all over the place and set the place on fire, we would not be recommending that we not pay a claim. But mm -hmm. our evidence shows that our police officers were very careful not to destroy anything in that Yeah. Kenny, house. there were also some civil right um, you know, issues brought up in that. It's, if, uh, it, uh, you know, my, my advice would be that that's, not, that's beyond what we're doing here today. Um, and could be handled in, in a different legal manner, but really doesn't have anything to do with the, with the search and the alleged damage. Am I right there? This is just a, a claim for the property damage, and uh, our position is that they were executing a lawful search warrant and also that there was no damage. So if they were executing a lawful search warrant, then we're exempt under state law. So what you're saying is if, if they were acting in a lawful manner, we have no discretion. Correct. Um, Eric, do you, you say, do you have pictures of what it looked like uh, when your property was damaged? Okay. 
Why don't you hand them to Councilman Stonecipher there and he can hand them down to us. There were no allegations of any personal injury made in this claim either. He's going to queue up that disc if you want to see the pictures that the police department took. Okay. And, Tina, I can ask the chief if you'd like, but what, what did the officers find when they conducted the search? The reports show that they found uh, weapons. Let me find it. There's a listing of that. They found a shotgun. They found a rifle, 68, 22 caliber Marlin Model 60 rifle. They found ammunition for those. There's 40, 45 caliber ammunition. They found a handgun in the wheel well, I believe, of the truck. Center console box of 45 caliber ammunition with 11 rounds. Passenger side rear floorboard, I located a gun box. Inside the gun box, I located one 30-30 round of live ammunition and five rounds of 38 special ammunition. Storage compartment on the rear driver's side of the truck, I located a high point 45 caliber model JHP serial number. And there's a serial number. We did a telephone uh, interview with the officer that was in charge of that. He said they only searched for spots where they would find the things that we were looking for, guns and ammo, and that they did not tear up any furniture. Or they weren't looking inside anything that couldn't hold a gun.
Uh, Mr. Fisher, do you have a, uh, a listing of what makes up the amount you're requesting, the $5,088? Yes, sir, I have a, I submitted a complete list. Uh, Excuse me. If you look at the first paragraph of the of the claim, it's a uh, the claimant alleges that the officers damaged the doors of his shed, the shed that was, and they did have to apparently break the lock to get into the shed. Uh, the driver's side panel of his pickup truck is what he alleges, although. Our evidence shows that there was no damage to that, and then several items of personal property unspecified. There was a second police search. Uh, my mother is here who can attest to that. She did write a small statement of my brother and her going over to my house, and then nothing was damaged, and then they went back the next day on the 22nd, and everything was just completely destroyed. So I have two witnesses that actually saw the, the before and after. Of from the 21st to the 22nd. I see. I believe this claim has to do with the date on which Mr. Fisher was arrested. Search warrant. Not a, I don't know about a second search warrant. I don't know about a second search. Yeah. Um, Chief, is there anything about a second search? I've heard of the second search. Everything I know of is based on the on the first search and the original arrest. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think our options here are to uh, remove this item and vote on it separately or keep it on the docket. And so I'll, I'll look for a motion either on the entire docket or to pull item 9U1A and vote on it separately. Well, Mayor, do we also, I mean, I would imagine we also would have an option of doing a little bit further investigation into this situation. And yeah, we can, we can, we can talk to, we can talk to the defendant and if there's any because we always do a follow-up on the use of force. So there's a follow-up on the use of force. The officers do the report. Uh, they do the reports on the search warrant. The only thing they indicated that they had to break was the, the lock on the shed. But uh, in listening to him, a lot of his complaints had to do with the county. A lot of his complaints had to do with a search warrant. Now, if that search warrant, if he wants to argue that it's not legal on its face, then that's to be determined by the courts on whether or not that search warrant is a valid search or not. So, I mean, his attorney will, will argue as to whether or not it's a valid search or not. Uh, I, we can look into a second search. To my knowledge, we didn't do a second search, but that doesn't mean something didn't happen. Well, and I'll definitely look into that. Well, Chief, I think if you would do that, and then maybe we pull this, mm -hmm. you know, if for some reason the search turned out to be invalid, we wouldn't be protected and we might have to make right. claims. Do you want to make a motion then to defer item 9U1A? Yes, I would make a motion that we defer. Two weeks, okay, Chief, or four? What would you like? That's fine. Two Why weeks. don't we do four weeks? Just four weeks. Give plenty okay. Of time. Second. All right. All right, Eric. So we're going to pull your item and um, let the chief look into it and get the council more information. Thank you, Mayor, Councilman, and Chief. April twenty fourth. Thanks for coming down. We really also thank you for your service to our country. You're welcome, sir. All thank right. you for your uh, service as well. Um, Meg, you want to make the motion then to defer two weeks? Yes, I would or make four a weeks, motion. Four yeah, weeks. I would make a motion that we All right, is there a second? Second. All right, we're voting on the deferral of item 9U1A. That item is deferred. Now, um, I'll look for a motion on item 9U1, uh, B, C, D, and E. All right, cast your votes, and those items are denied. All right, we're on to item 10. This is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under claims recommended for approval? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 11 is uh, items from council. James, you have anything for us? Oh, I'm, yeah, let's go ahead and do the ordinance first, Todd. Let's start with that. Thank you, Mayor. I, I knew you wouldn't want to leave on your last day without talking about roosters or That's chickens. Right. So uh, the change behind this ordinance and really the only change in this ordinance is that previously Trailer houses or mobile homes weren't considered a dwelling in this ordinance. So um, if you lived in a trailer house or a mobile home, your neighbor could put a, uh, a pen of roosters right next to it, depending upon where the property line is, and code enforcement was unable to, to do anything about it. So 
All this really does is cleans up that language so that we can include trailer houses and mobile homes as a dwelling. So with that, I would move that we send this back to the Planning Commission for their review. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to move out of 11A uh, back to the Planning Commission for a further action. All right, let's vote on that. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Uh, James, you want another chance to, to go around with some counsel? All right, Larry, Todd. Just real quickly, I attended a, uh, a forum in far southeastern Oklahoma City. Uh, Sheriff Todd Gibson from Cleveland County was there. It was out on 119th and Anderson Road. Uh, and Sergeant Steve Burkeen showed up from the Oklahoma City Police Department. We had a great crowd out there, about 40 people, uh, talking about crime in the rural areas and, and coming up with different ideas on ways that we can minimize the impact of that. And I just wanted to say thank you to both Sheriff Todd Gibson and his staff and uh, Sergeant Steve Burkeen for showing up. It was a good event. Good. David? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, two items. One's a question to Kenny. Uh, Kenny, can the city enact ordinances related to uh, mainly drinking establishments that, that serve alcohol that require them to do something in, in respect to reducing the risk of people driving you know, after they become intoxicated? And <clears throat> at this point, I don't have any specific recommendations, but do we have any uh, flexibility as far as enacting ordinances along those lines, or is that strictly a state issue? I haven't specifically re uh, investigated or researched that issue, but my guess is that it's been preempted by the state, that it would be outside of our authority, but we can look at that and get back with you. And what I was thinking was something as far as whether they're posters or some type of signage or some type of information that would encourage people, you know, if they have been drinking, to find an alternative way to get home and maybe even, you know, the use of either taxis or Uber or some other service, again, just to reduce the chances of somebody driving after they've been drinking. Yeah, we, we have limited legal authority to regulate alcoholic beverage establishments. That sounds like something that the ABLE Commission could, should do under its uh, regulatory power. They could probably do it by an order, but we'll look at it and see okay. if we have any authority. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay, sure. then the second item, uh, I just would like to announce uh, or remind people that on March 29th at 10 a.m. at the uh, History Center, there's a, uh, the opening of a Vietnam exhibit titled Welcome Home, and it honors all Oklahomans who gave their life for our country uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, close to a thousand Oklahomans died. Uh, and included in that are stories of native Oklahomans who fought in the Vietnam War, interwined with stories of Vietnam refugees who have settled in Oklahoma City in a special exhibit uh, on display, again, beginning March 29th, which is national uh, Vietnam War Veterans Day through November 6, 2019. And Welcome Home, uh, Oklahomans and the War in Vietnam is a cum accumulation of a year's worth of work by the History Center staff and a steering committee comprised of Vietnam refugees and service veterans. Work began on the exhibit after History Center Director Bob Blackburn received the memoir Black Cat 2-1, The True Story of a Vietnam Helicopter Pilot and His Crew, written by Bob Ford of Shawnee Milling Company. Now, Shawnee Milling Company has been uh, very gracious to the city of Oklahoma City, providing uh, food for all of the animals at the animal shelter for several years now. And, uh, and I've heard Bob uh, speak on this uh, subject and, and recalling his time in Vietnam. And uh, it puts efforts in motion, uh, said Larry O'Dell, Director of Special Projects and co 
curator, Nicole Harvey, Ford arranged for a replica Huey helicopter to be shipped to the History Center from Texas. Crews had to remove windows along the museum's south side so the helicopter could be assembled inside the center. It hangs over the exhibit's entrance where guests are somberly greeted with names of the nearly 1,000 Oklahomans who died during the 10 years of U.S.-involved conflict. And it's, it's a sad and, and uh, somewhat strange period in our histories, in our nation's history. Uh, these young men were sent to Vietnam. They followed uh, exactly what they were told to do, and then upon returning home, many times were not welcomed. Uh, the instances of, uh, of mental issues and other problems uh, were not addressed. Uh, even today, uh, they have trouble uh, fitting in uh, at times in society. I remember in college, a gentleman who had came back from Vietnam had a little piece of shrapnel work its way up to the surface of his skin during class. and so. Uh, it was just, again, a, a tough time, and uh, I hope everyone can uh, uh, view the exhibit. Thank you. Okay, John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on tonight, uh, beginning at 7 o'clock, we will hold the Ward 7 Economic Development Town Hall at the Greater Mount Olive Baptist Church, 10. 40 Northeast 42nd Street. We encourage everyone to come. We are uh, going to be providing an update as it relates to TIF District uh, number nine. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mark? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, today we have uh, Tommy and Gabby Noble here today, and uh, they wanted to come up and they signed up to speak to uh, uh, thank us for the uh, issuance and purchases of the bonds that are for park and recreation. Some of them are going to uh, some soccer fields, and uh, I'm delighted to have them here. Uh, if you want to know anything about soccer, you ask these two people because they know what's going on in Oklahoma City. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm Gabby Doble. This is Tom Noble, and we are from the executive board of the NOKC Soccer Club. We are actually here to thank you all for your support of the expansion and the improvement of our current facility. It's very needed. Um, our current membership is about 2,000 players ranging in the ages of 4 to 19. These fields are gonna make us be able to serve our current members so much better. So we are very grateful. Also, we're gonna be able to host bigger and better tournaments. Two weeks ago, we hosted a tournament and we had 182 teams wow. at our current facility. And we even had to turn teams away. We didn't have enough space. Of those 182 teams, 50 of those teams required a hotel stay, a two night hotel stay. So those families, stayed in our hotels, ate in our restaurants, and enjoyed what Oklahoma City has to offer. So we're proud of that. So we feel like more fields gives us more opportunity and also has a positive economic impact for the city of Oklahoma City. So we wanna thank you all very much. Well, thank you. We have seen economic development come from our parks department and our investments before, and so thanks for validating that, that effort. And thanks for what you all are doing. I'm, I'm guessing you all aren't highly paid for your work as, a, as a soccer expert. Yes. Yes. So, uh, if we had time, the, 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 the work that Tommy does uh, just for free in, in building soccer fields is amazing. He and Tim McLaughlin mm -hmm. uh, work all over the city, and it's, it's just wonderful what they are doing, and I am so proud of their work. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful to see. Thank you. Thank thanks. you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, uh -huh. could I make a comment? I've, I forgot to announce something. Sure. This coming Saturday, the Windsor Area Business Group is sponsoring an Easter festival to be held uh, on, the, on 23rd Street, Northwest 23rd, just east of the Brahms, uh, which is just east of Meridian. It goes from 1 to 3. There'll be a number of activities for kids, so bring your children, your grandchildren, and have a great time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks, Larry. All right, City Manager reports. Mayor, we do have the March sales tax, sales and use tax collection report. I want to highlight a, a couple things. It, you know, it was in the paper and it showed this, this big graph that, that Bill Crumman put in, which is not inaccurate. His, his numbers are correct. But we need to keep in mind that that 
was is out of proportion because of the additional quarter cent sales tax that's come, that came in. So if you take out the additional quarter cent sales tax, we're up um, for, for the month right about 11 percent. And that's a really good month. Mm -hmm. But Russell Evans had predicted that we would be up 9% for that month. So it's it, it just, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be negative here at all, because I think the, the, obviously checks are, but it, it really points out how, uh, one, how good Russell is. As a matter of fact, Russell uh, gave us a range for, for this present year of growth to be in the 55 to 6% growth range. And right now, if you discount it for the new quarter cent sales tax, it's coming in at 5.6%. So, which is right in right in Russell's range. So, it, it just validates again what what he does for us, and we just need to remember that the reason it's 5.6 percent, why why we're having partly is because we're down so low, and so we're just getting back to 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 levels of where we are before. And again, this is this is positive. I'm not trying trying to, but I think it's just important that we understand the full impact of what what that sales tax check looks like. Also, Mayor, uh, I would like to present you with your gavel to take with you <laughs> for, for your, your service. All right, thank you. A and Dina, can we get his name tag? Or maybe somebody can reach over. We're gonna, we've got to present you with your name tag. Okay. You know, and I do want to tell one, one quick story uh, about the mayor. Um, you know, he, we, we we're very blessed to have had three mayors in 31 years. And that kind of stability is unheard of throughout the country. He's mixed with the leading, uh, the longest serving mayor of any major city right now. And three mayors in 31 years, that uh, constant leadership is, is fabulous. And we talked about mixed leadership skills already this morning, a lot of comments about that. But his communication skills, I think, are, are really something that served our city well. When he was the president of the, of the Conference of Mayors, he had the opportunity to be really the spokesman for all the, the country's mayors a, a number of times. And for the way he can boil down talking points and be able to come off and, and be on top of things on every issue is just remarkable how he's able to do that. And I can't tell you how many times at 7 o'clock in the morning he would call me and he'd say, I'm going on CNN or I'm going on The Morning <laughs> Joe, and they're going to ask me a bunch of things, but they're going to ask me about this, nut, this new HUD policy or something like that. What do you know about this? Well, you know, if he didn't know anything about it, I certainly <laughs> didn't know anything about it. So I would make a couple of phone calls and see what I could, you know, if, you know what, what we could find on it. And, you know, I'd give him about that much, and he would be able to turn that and into looking just like an expert on this issue, <laughs> given that much information on it in, in about 15 minutes. So his, his communication skills are always of boiling down complex issues and being able to communicate those in, in a clear and concise manner to our public has just served us well over the last 14 years. And of all the things about him that are great, I think we're going to miss that maybe more than anything else. Thanks. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thanks, Jim. It's, it's been an honor to work with you. Um, we've got citizens to be heard. Citizens to be heard. Um, Philip, forward. Good morning. I'll ask our citizens to be heard to keep their comments to three minutes or less. Hopefully it won't be that long. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Well, we will need your name and address for the record. My name is Philip Smith and I'm a resident of Shawnee, Oklahoma. Um, just really quickly, thank you for your service. What I've witnessed today is diligence and leadership and that's exceptional today. Um, quickly, I'm a pro se litigant in a child removal case and my child lives in Nebraska and he's in a bad situation. I understand you've green lit, green lighted, however you would say it, Costco's development. What I've done is I've subpoenaed records and Walmart complied. My subpoena was good enough for Walmart, but it wasn't good enough for Costco. The question I'm posing to you is do you want to allow a corporation that does not comply with legal process into the state of Oklahoma? I'll let you answer that to your own citizens. I properly serve Costco, their registered agent in the state of Nebraska, a properly served subpoena. They had 10 days to send me a uh, third party objection. They did not do so within that time frame. What you see before you is a worksheet with underlines. That's the objection they sent me. That's what you might find yourselves receiving someday from Costco. If I were you, I would request that Costco have a legal department within the state of Oklahoma and not just a registered agent. 
I have nothing against Costco. I used to be a member. I like Costco, and I think it would be a good competition. But again, Walmart complied with my properly served subpoena. And that's all I have for you today. All right. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate your patience. All right, Ronnie, come on up. Bring Emmanuel with you. Mr. Mayor, my name is Ronnie Kirk. <clears throat> I live at 2328 North Missouri here in Oklahoma City. This is Emmanuel's fourth city council meeting. And uh, what I want to speak of on the kids, I was fed kids for 28 years free. I care about kids. So I, I took a proposal up to the Capitol, went to all the senators' offices, got the cards, gave, out, they gave them the same papers that I'm giving y'all today. It's, it's saying, for, for the AR-15 and the bomb stock, I suggested to them that we uh, have a bomb stock AR-15 registry. We have registrations for sex offenders, where we keep track of them. We have registrations for your cell phone. You can pick it up, find it in 30 minutes' time. There's a chip inside your car. They can find your chip. They can find your car anywhere. You can press the computer here today and find a monkey way over in Africa with a chip in it. So my suggestion is all guns being sold in the state of Oklahoma, don't worry about taking their guns. It's too late to take, out, take their guns. People worry about all the gun laws, they're going to take their guns. Don't worry about taking their guns. What we need is a registration form. If they sell their gun, put a chip in it. All guns coming into the state of Oklahoma have a chip put in it. All guns, the manufacturers already have a record who they sold these AR-15s and the bump stocks. They already have a record of it. All we need, need, need to know is who they sold those guns to, where we can keep a record of who they sold the guns to. We'll know the people that we have to watch. If, if Emmanuel sold a gun to me, he'd have to have a chip put in it letting them know where that gun is and where it went. I can't take it out of the city, the state, or the county for which it live. I have all the guns I want around my wall, but you cannot move them out of your city, state, or county. Can't put them on a plane. Can't put them on a train. Can't take them nowhere. You can have all you want. We're not trying to take the gun, but this way we'll keep a record on where those guns are, the people we need to watch it to narrow it down. We'll narrow it down to who we need to watch. The ones who is mentally unstable, the ones who might have access to the, we'll know where the guns are. You know when they're moved. You know when they're stolen. People report when they're stolen. So you can find out where that, chip, where that gun is. They can, they can find the phone. They can surely find a chip in a gun. And for as the, the sales of the chips can be used to give the teachers a raise. It can be used to fund a many of things. Everybody, let them have their guns. Any gun they have, if you sell it to any one of the council members, have a chip put in it. It's easy to keep up with. With today's technology, this is possible. The kids from Windsor Hill, And the principal, the ladies in the office, they'll probably watch the city council meeting tomorrow. The last city council meeting that day, Emmanuel was so proud, they showed the whole city council meeting to the kids. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, we all wish you well on your new journey into the future. Thank so I, we already did some of the footwork, but as a, we're just two leaves on the tree. We need for you all who represent us to branch out to some of the people that we've already went to the office and gave these all senators, every last one of them. We did, a, we already did some of the footwork and made some of the, some of the suggestions that this is possible if we all work together and make it possible. 
The kids in Florida shouldn't have to do the fight by themselves. They need some adults helping them. And I come to y'all hoping y'all can help me and Emmanuel and the senators get something together for Oklahoma. Maybe the other states will follow. We try to be number one in Oklahoma for doing so many things. So let's all get together, at least try to make this work. It is possible today. Thanks, Ronnie. Appreciate Thank the you, idea. Sir. And good luck on your new journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Council, thank you all. See you. Mayor, the bond documents are not quite ready, so I think it would be prudent to go into executive session okay. and deal with that when we come back out. All right. We have executive session. We'll be back. We have returned from executive session. and We have the results of our bond sale. Yes, go ahead. Greg. Yes, so this is on item 9F1 and 2 is our tax exempt sale. You remember Kenny explained last week that we uh, did this as two sales. One is a taxable, one is a tax exempt. On the tax exempt bonds, which were at $82,750,000, the winning bid was from Citigroup Global Markets at 3.16. Um, very tight spread, and we had um, 11 bidders on our tax exempt bonds. So, so very successful sale. On, and item F1 and 2 will be the award of the sale and then the ordinance. And on the ordinance, we will need the emergency. Craig, tell us the difference in the first two bidders. So the first bidder was 3.1659. The second bidder was 3.1693. So very close. And the top bid, the highest bidder was 3.23. So it was very tight. It was really good, very wow. successful. And I think it's express, you know, it's really reflective of the council's success and leadership of the AAA bond rating of the, the leadership of our um, you know, city departments and the team and the support of our citizens. Yeah. And so the difference between taxable and non-taxable was, was, was? So on item G1 and 2, the taxable, which was $40,990,000, the winning bid was Raymond James and Associates at 3.40. It's three, rounded to 3.41. Okay, so you need an emergency motion for the issuance? We need the, yes, on the ordinances on both, we'll need the emergency. First, we need to award the contract. That's correct. F1. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second on 9F1. This is the award of the purchase, passage unanimously. On the ordinance, yes. F2. F2. On F2, I'm sorry. All right. Cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Cast your votes. 8 0. And then we'll need the same thing on G1 and 2. Right. Meg, you want to just keep going? You're, you're on a roll. <laughs> okay, we're voting on item 9G1. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Okay, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. And I do want to express appreciation to our team. We've got our bond counsel here, John Michael Williams with Williams Box for Shane Bullard. And then we've got Jared Davidson is here as public finance law. Um, our financial advisors with public financial man management, Jennifer Arndt and Dennis Whaley are here also. And then our team, um, Kenny Sudel is our assistant finance director and Mike Baskin is our debt manager. And I just appreciate everyone that works on the team. And again, the leadership of the city council. Thank all you all. Right. Thanks very much. All right, also in executive session, the council reviewed the, the, the salary status and the, the, the pay rate for our three employees that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, report to us. And um, as is typical of, of past councils, we have uh, increased the salaries based on the raise given to management with the STEP program. In this case, it comes to about 2.964% for each of the three. 
We have uh, renewed the car allowance for the city manager and the municipal counselor. We have increased the size of the car allowance for the city auditor from 3,000 a year to 6,000 a year. That all sound right? Effective January. Effective January 1st, 2018. This will be the, the first raise for this level employee in three years. So thanks for your patience and thanks for your work. Thank you. You bet. Is there a motion? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. All right, well, that well, was the manager. That was the manager's. All right, how about the municipal counselor? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And on uh, the city auditor. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. All right, we're done. Thanks, everybody. Take that gavel with you. Okay. <laughs> yes, it has uh, the date of your first meeting and uh -huh. today's date, your last. Oh, my.